The Pope and Young Club wants to welcome you as we rally together to ensure our bow hunting opportunities for today and tomorrow. You've come to the podcast that believes in preserving, protecting, and promoting the passion for bow hunting. Join us as we strive to be the voice of today's bow hunter. This is the Pope and Young Podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Pope and Young Podcast. I'm Jason Roundsville, joined by my co-host, Dylan Ray. And we have our guest today is Pope and Young past president and bow hunter extraordinaire, Jim Willems. Jim, welcome. Uh, how you doing, Jason? Dylan? Doing, doing good. To good. Be with you. I don't think either of us are as good as Jason because he just got back from Mexico killing anything that moved. Uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. You know, it's, this may be the one bow hunting area where I'm ever ahead of Jim is that I shot something the day before yesterday with my bow. So, well, and, and, and Jason, I've never even shot a javelina. So, so you, you're up on me. Oh, that's okay. Well, we now, we now found the one place that, that I, uh, have we got to back up. Why have I'm you not Jim? I can't imagine. Um, pretty simple, pretty simple, Dylan. Um, my daughter and I each drew a tag first time we decided to go hunt them. And she drew the youth tag and I drew the adult tag and New, New Mexico's a drawing. Um, and uh, I took her out and, and she was like 11 and she's going to rifle hunt and I was going to bow hunt. And, and of course, she's the kid. She gets to shoot first, right? So she, she shot a javelina, big old male. Um, great hunt for kids, man. A great opportunity for kids because you can shoot a relatively small rifle or, or lightweight bow and, and uh, you can get in on them. But anyhow... She killed a javelina before I did, and we took it home, and it was basically inedible. Uh, I don't know, you know, they got that gland on their back, and I, I tried to stay away from it, but uh, I decided I didn't like to eat them, so I never went back and hunted them. You that know, simple. I've heard that a lot, and the only time I ever have eaten them, I'll, I'll give it this. We were sitting, you know, it was on the border of Mexico, and and around a fire with our buddies and the grills going and you got music playing it's that atmosphere of just got done hunting so anything really tastes good you know um you've been out sure. hunting all day um and we were sitting around and and we grilled some up and it was fantastic and and we were all sitting around like why does everybody talk about how bad these are it could have been the atmosphere but that was the only time i've ever had them but it was really good the one time i had them well, you know, I hear that a lot too. Uh, when I hunt coos deer in, in Mexico, the Mexican guys, they'd rather eat the javelina than deer. So yeah. I don't know if it was just, I got a, a male that was, you know, rutting and um, right. who knows what, but it, it, it tasted like that gland smells on their back and it, it was pretty bad. Oh, so I, uh, I, I'll probably go try again at some point, but they're, they're not too high on my list. Yeah, yeah. I can assure you that they smell every bit of what you would expect them to smell like by <laughs> looking at a picture of a javelina they yep. do not smell great and yep. the uh where we were they cooked it up for us and they brought out this plate and everybody's looking at me and they're like hey you get to go it's your pig you get to go first and so i'm like all right I, and it was good but a lot of it i mean they also fed us ducks and geese and and everything else that was good and normally that's not you know, like a ribeye steak. So, right. um, it, it was good. Everybody tried it. Everybody liked it. So well, good. It was, good uh, you. yeah. And it was fun. Something, if something a little bit different to do first oh, time absolutely. I'd, I'd had an opportunity. So I was pretty excited to do it. Yeah. So, and I know, I understand you've been working, you're in Kansas. So what have you been doing? Prepping, prepping your property there. Well, holy smokes, it's just endless. Uh, I, I've been working on CRP, the Conservation Reserve Program, a whole bunch of little pieces of property that are in the CRP. For, it's for erosion protection and, and for wildlife, uh, wildlife habitat. And you can't let trees grow in it, so you have to cut the trees out. And of course, I kind of like the trees there, so I let them grow a little bit until they either get too unsightly or someone from the federal government says, Hey, Jim, uh, you gotta go cut those trees. 
So I started out doing that. And then I had another uh, eight acre patch that uh, is in a new contract. And the contract said I needed to burn it and, and then plant it. And, and uh, you got to burn between March 1st and April 15th. You can't burn after bird nesting season. So, uh, so I burnt that yesterday. And, and then I have another eight acre patch that I need to plant that I didn't have to burn, but I have to go work it up. So it's all just, you know, taking care of the property and keeping in compliance with the, the government programs, uh, which is a total pain, but it's one way to have more habitat and conservation reserve program has been great for hunters and outdoorsmen because of it has. all the additional habitat. And uh, it looked like it was going to go away there for a while. I had, I had some contracts come up and there was a couple of years when I didn't really know if I was going to have to go back to farming it because you, you have to have some income off of it. And uh, just before I was getting ready to work it up and, and uh, farm it, uh, they had new programs. So I got it signed up again. So all good. Just, hard sweaty dirty work yeah and this is where you got that the property you killed your big buck on a couple of years ago nope oh different one N no different property yeah. okay so have, yeah close by close, close by, by but yeah so it's paying it, you expect it to pay off oh absolutely it, okay. it always pays off yeah and yeah. then plus the pheasants and the quail and the turkey they all love it so so it's all good yeah i'm curious how how have you seen the the last couple of years we've had a, a pheasant uh, the population's been down how have you seen it out your way uh it's it's bad you know the yeah. the drought from uh what 12 to 14 um mm -hmm. just literally wiped them out and they just haven't come back um yeah in fact i haven't shot a pheasant the last two years which you know i grew up eating pheasant i'd shoot 60 a year easily so uh you see a few, but they just aren't coming back. Right. And, and, and now we have really dry conditions this spring. So who, who knows what's going to happen, but yeah, the quail have been good. Um, the Turkey took a hit, but they're coming back. I saw a lot of turkeys last fall, so that's looking good. So if they, they have a decent hatch, have some decent weather, it'll be good. Now, do you chase turkeys much? I do. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't take it real seriously because the, the way my properties are set up, you know, I'll go set in a blind in the morning. And, uh, if I don't call in a Turkey the first morning, I usually get one the second or the third at, at the worst. So I set up a couple of blinds and then I don't move around and hunt them real hard. I just go set in the blind for a couple hours and throw up a decoy and call and, and, uh, I'll, I'll typically shoot two in far in uh, Kansas and two in New Mexico nice. in the spring. And then, uh, um, I used to shoot two in the fall in Kansas, but last year they only gave me one tag. So there's that. And then I'm in Kansas during the New Mexico fall turkey hunt. So I don't get to shoot one in New Mexico. Yeah. It's nice to be able to expand your seasons a little bit with the spring stuff. It is. And, and man, I really like to eat them. You know, yeah. I, I, I feel bad if I don't get my limit every, every chance I get. Now, any, uh, any bear hunts coming up this spring? Oh, uh, maybe. Um, I, I have a lead on a kind of a last minute deal in, in Manitoba and I've never hunted bears in Canada. I typically just do the do it yourself stuff and the lower 48, although I hunted bears in Alaska a little bit. Um, but I have an opportunity that came up that I'm trying to make work. It's, it's in June, a little short notice and we'll, we'll see if we can make it happen. Nice. And is that, uh, anything in particular you're looking for up there, a color phase or anything? No. Cause, because, uh, you know, in the Southwest where I live, there's lots of light colored bears and I choose okay. as many Brown or cinnamon bears as I do black ones. So no, I'll just be looking for a big bear. That's, that's all that matters. Nice. And how, how high are you in the book now with, with bears? I have uh, not real high. I have three that are over 20 inches okay and and a couple couple in the 19s so so i've done really well and that's part of the reason i haven't killed a bear in the last 12 years is i keep trying to find something really big and i can find them now and then i just can't seem to sneak up on them yeah and what's your favorite way to spot and stock 
Well, it's, uh, it's more still hunting. Um, okay. I, I, I hunt the, in the oak brush when they're eating the acorns. Um, you know, you hunt the food source and, and, uh, you don't I'd hardly ever see them before I hear them. And it's more listening stock sneaking up in the, in the acorns. And you can early in the season, you can hear them breaking off limbs to get to the, get the acorns. Okay. And, you know, if you hear one that sounds like a lumberjack, then, you know, that's a big bear breaking a big old limb or breaking a tree over. And then you try to sneak up on that one. And later in the season, you know, they're picking them up off the ground. So you, you can hear them crunching, you know, before you get too close. So, so that's a really fun hunt. Nice. And where's your, where's your favorite place to do that? Well, I I've hunted, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado, all three, um, you know, the Arizona hunt is a drawing where I was hunting and, and, uh, my favorite place in New Mexico is a drawing and I've only drawn it once. So I just kind of, you know, wherever I can get a tag the last few years, I've hunted Colorado because I found a big bear up there three years ago and I just haven't been able to get him. Hmm. That's, and have you bumped into him on multiple occasions? Um, twice. Yeah. Um, both times it was too thick and, and I couldn't get a shot and just, you know, couldn't get close enough for a shot before he heard me. And, right. Uh, and, you know, I thought I could go in a different direction the second time and get in on him, but that didn't work either. And then this last fall, I went up there looking for him and I, I couldn't find him. So a little different year for food sources and bears move around a lot. And I just, I just couldn't find him. Huh. Yeah, it's where I spend a lot of time. It's it's pretty thick, and you just don't don't see them as often as what you would think you would. Oh yeah, you know, you know they're there. You see the logs torn up and different things, but but you just don't see them very often. Right. So, but if you get a good spot, one thing I've found is uh, they they tend to come back. If you spook them, they they come back and feed in the same spot. So you have to figure out how to do it where they can't see and wind you and and uh, shoot. I, I've had I had one bear that I snuck in on, decided he wasn't big enough and went and hunted a different area, you know, a quarter mile away. And then was walking back through to my truck and, um, he's back in there feeding again, huh. you know, he'd, he'd run off and, you know, an hour later he comes back. So, so that, that makes it fun. Yeah. If you can find them. Very nice. So if, if you're chasing, I think I'll bet I know the answer to this, but if you're just chasing one thing, what would it be? Yeah, you know, I'd hate to even hate, hate for that to be the case, but I guess it would probably be whitetail because it's a longer yeah. season. Um, you know, it's a lot of places you can only shoot one buck, but at least you can shoot a doe or two. Yeah. So, so whitetail, but, but boy, I, if I don't hunt, um, elk, whitetails and, and, uh, black bears every year, I, I feel like I had a bad year and, antelope's kind of the same way although i'm i'm a little short on antelope i lost my place to hunt in wyoming so so now i'm back to the draw public land hoping to find something yeah that's i i uh had a lot of fun hunting those this year and so now i'm i'm looking forward to getting back out there and then it's like uh oh don't don't have enough points for here and can't quite get in there so it's it's interesting playing the game to to get you the right opportunities yeah yeah, now, I don't mean to, to uh, question. Yeah, I, go ahead, Dylan. I don't mean to throw out any kind of promises here, but I've got some really good private ground in Western Kansas. I've never taken advantage of it. Um, I get invited every year, and and I've never done it, but they tag out every year, all of them, um, here in Kansas. So, well, I I would be there every year if I if I had a spot. I you know it's uh, just. I've just never taken advantage of it. And I, I know I need to, um, but they do it, you know, they do it spot and stalk and they do it really hard. And, you know, the success oh, yeah. rate in Kansas with a bow is like 5% or something like that. So um, just a, a really difficult hunt, but I'm sure Mr. Willems can make it happen. Well, you know, spot and stalk is tough with traditional equipment because, yeah. uh, you know, there's a whole lot of difference between 30 yards and 50 yards. Right. Yeah, um, which is uh, kind of what you're dealing with, but, but, you know, getting back to a single species, you know, I, I, I probably enjoy hunting elk about as much as anything, 
Uh, but if that was the only animal I could hunt, the, the, the good tags are all a drawing. And, and uh, you know, I, I don't even average one tag a year for elk. And, and I, I couldn't imagine not being able to hunt one species in a couple of different states. So, uh, you know, if you give me a good tag in two states every year for elk, that would be my favorite. But with whitetail, you can get a tag and, and you can hunt multiple states and, you know, there's just more opportunities, just so many more of them. Yeah. And so what's your, what would be your dream? You could hunt one thing, any, anything you wanted on the planet here's here's your golden ticket what would you cash it in on boy that's a tough one you know it it used to be bison i i really wanted right. to hunt a bison with my bow and and i was lucky enough to draw a tag in utah so i got that done um you, you know people ask me about my bucket list and and son of a gun i've done really all of the things that i really really wanted to do uh there was a time when i thought i would get a grand slam with my bow but um that got too expensive and and you, you go on one expensive hunt and you don't even knock up an arrow it's like well i'm not doing that anymore yeah so so uh you know i'd i'd, I'd love to have a good sheep hunt a bighorn sheep in in colorado or montana i'd love to do that i guess that would be the golden ticket um but it's only going to happen once yeah, if i'm lucky you know statistically you will never get a license to hunt bighorn sheep um but you know a lot of guys get lucky you know one yeah. out of one out of three or four statistically will get it in their lifetime so it could happen yeah yeah i'd like to know where to get some of them golden tickets yeah well you know you can buy the uh the lottery tickets the um you know every state sells lottery tickets for a bighorn sheep hunt and a hundred dollars worth of tickets and i know shoot i know a half a dozen people who have drawn one of those tags from just buying the, the raffle tickets um, yeah but i'm not one of them i haven't got one yet yeah this is the first year um well they didn't have it last year but this is the first time that i've been to the western hunt expo where i wasn't at the table when somebody got called for for a uh, bighorn tag yeah or, or a sheep tag yeah well, it's bound to happen. It's yeah. just not that many of them. I just figured, hey, one of these days, you know, there's only 10 spots at a table. If I'm there long enough, one of them is going to eventually be my spot. Right. So, yeah. It's, uh, that's a, that's sure a nice one to think about though. Oh, it is. Yeah. And my bucket list is still a little longer. So I've got a few more on there that I'd be okay with winning. Yeah. I understand that. So now, uh, tell us about, I, I know you're for, for anybody who's listening that, that may not know, um, Jim's been on the show with us before and, and, uh, does a lot of public speaking engagements, um, and does what 98% of your stuff with, with traditional equipment. Yes. Yeah. At least that. Okay. I, I shot a, I shot a brown bear in Alaska with a compound bow, and then I hunted uh, some big stuff in Africa with the same compound. So it, basically, that was my dangerous game bow. Um, I just couldn't, I, I can't shoot a heavy enough recurve to hunt animals like that. Although I did, uh, I did shoot my bison with, you know, that's a big animal. Shot it with a sixty pound recurve and shot clear through him. So wow. you know, maybe wow. um, maybe I'm fooling myself that. You know, I could have hunted some of those animals, but, uh, you know, it, it, you, you do what you do and give it your best shot. You, you certainly don't want to go under bowed. No. And, uh, you know, my, my 52 pound recurve, the one I hunt with all the time, I've shot through elk with it and I've killed a couple of moose with it. So it's, it's perfectly adequate for, you know, everything, but the, the really huge stuff. You know, Dylan is, is a big supporter of of the trad stuff he's excited about it. i know you and you can thank jim for that i know i know you and and harvey ebers and and some other guys got him kind of hooked on it and dylan actually had an opportunity when he was out at, at portland a couple weeks ago to show me his trad skills in action so all right yeah it was yeah. it was neat to see and how'd that turn out dylan uh, i don't know i don't remember 
Yeah, I didn't think you would. <laughs> I've slept since then. So, yeah, they had a little, uh, I think it was the Sylvan Archers had a deal there where you can go up for a buck and arrow and, and shoot some some trad setups. So Dylan and I did it. And we, him with his extensive training from world-class, you know, trad guys and me just stumbling through it. We actually both popped the same number of balloons. So I was kind so, of excited about that. You're just a natural, Jason. I guess so. Or I got lucky. <laughs> Sometimes it's better hey, to be lucky than good. Listen, yeah. I, I experienced my first, like, I was mad at how natural they were. And uh, I got my brother a recurve. And and uh, we were at my house shooting. And he had shot his recurve like three times, Jim. And I'm like, well, hey, man, you know, I got 3Ds in the backyard. And, and uh, he's like, how far is that hog target? And I'm like, it's 32 yards. And, uh, and he's like, all right. And he started stacking arrows in the kill zone. I'm talking like, <laughs> uh, it was insane. Yeah. And I was literally mad at how good he was. And so we walk inside the house and my dad was like, well, how'd it, how'd it go? You know? And, uh, and I was just like, just walk right by him. I'm like, shut up. I don't want to talk about it. I I've been there, Dylan. I feel your pain. Some people That's just got it, man. Yeah. Some people do. And some people just have to work at it for years yeah. and years. I got to work on it for sure. Yeah. You know, when I first started shooting a, a compound bow, I didn't have, I just shot that instinctively because I didn't have sights on it or anything. And, and so I did that and, and I used to shoot it quite a bit. I had a buddy that worked at a dairy. And so while he'd finish up milking the cows, I'd go around and shoot starlings and whatever else moved. And, and, uh, and you get pretty good doing that too. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. then, I, then I put sights on it. And so I had pins, I think I had pins out to 50 yards, but I was never, it was before laser range finders and I was never the best judge of distance. I'm like, ah, yeah, that's about 35 yards. Oh, nope. Turns out it was 45 shot under it. Yeah. So that, that was my range finders. Oh, I was low. So it must've been farther than I thought. Yeah. You know, the range finder changed bow hunting uh dramatically just being able to know exactly the exact yardage uh, it extended a lot of people's ranges which is you know good and bad the, the good thing is that people are out hunting and they're they're successful so they keep at it the the bad thing is it, it allows people to shoot farther than they really should be shooting um but but that's uh that's a situational ethics that every person has to deal with on his own yeah and i know for me i i I enjoy it just because, you know, I was never really good at the, at the range game. And it's like, well, I, I know it's between 40 and 60 yards, but it, you know, it makes a huge difference whether it's 43 or 59. And, um, yes, you know, sometimes you guess and you're right on and then you make a great perfect shot. But then there's other times where, you know, it's nice to know that yardage. So, you know, you're going to put that arrow exactly where it needs to be. Right. So, now, what, Jim, tell us a little bit more, because you've been around, how long have you been a member of Pope and Young? Uh, since 1987. So what's that? 35 years? I guess that's, that's 35 years. That's a pretty good experience right there. And Boy, that's a long time. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the other changes that you have seen, not only in bow hunting, but also in the club? You know, I, I, I know we hear... Yeah, I, I talk to people and they they still think, well, you know, you, you don't allow more than a 65% let off and that doesn't work for me. And, you know, what are some of the things that you've seen, I guess, the big changes, technological changes in your time? Yeah. So, yeah, you can start going back to the beginning. Of course, the compound bow was before my time, but that was obviously the biggest change. And, and I understand that was, you know, really controversial within the bow hunting community at the time, whether it was even a bow or not so uh um they went through that in the early 70s and and of course pope and young club represent bow hunters so you know if bow hunters are going to be shooting compound bows then you know we have we have to accept compound bows which is obviously the right thing to do so then it was uh people were the club was concerned about the technology related to a compound bow and they were worried about it just being too easy and so they come out with the 65% uh, uh, let off rule that anything above that isn't, 
isn't bird chase anymore. And, and, uh, you know, as time goes on, bows get more efficient and then 70 to 75, 80% let off was, was the norm. So we had to adapt to fit that because if the majority of bow hunters are shooting one thing and we say that's not acceptable, then once again, are you representing bow hunting or are you representing a particular type of bow hunting? So we went through that. Um, you know, the laser range finder really wasn't an issue for the club, uh, but it is one of those things that we had to deal with realizing that it, everything that makes it easier also affects whether it's really fair chase or not. And, and that's what we're all about. We, we, we are all about fair chase hunting and, and, you know, we will continue to hunt as long as the general public accepts the fact that, that we are doing a good thing. And if it's fair, and seems legitimate, then the general public will allow you to do it. And, and once we cross the line and, and uh, the public looks at that and says, boy, that's, that's just not right. Then, then we're going to go down really fast. So, so that's the reason you have governing bodies that try to determine what is proper and what's not, because you can't just have anything goes, um, yeah. you know, even at the, you know, the very beginning, everybody realized that spotlighting deer at night and shooting them was not proper so that's illegal that's a line in the sand everybody understands that um and, and you know you start from there and then then what is that line and there's a whole lot of gray areas and technology is always a problem and and we the club come up with a really simple solution back i don't know probably 2000 um no electronics on the bow or the arrow that that it's a blanket statement that covers everything if it's electronic then it's not fair chase and, and it made perfect sense because there really weren't a lot of electronics at the time that were being used on the bow. Um, but then along came lighted knocks, lighted sights, um, bow mounted cameras, all of these electronics that you can put on the bow. So we've had to adapt as, as things go on. And, uh, you know, that's technology wise, but, you know, some of the really positive things that, that I've lived through is, um, accepting uh velvet entries yeah you know, it, uh, that that was a that was a big deal in the day and and at first you know the the velvet adds to the size of the rack because it's there's some you know it, it's another layer there doesn't add much to it we've come to find out but uh when they first decided they were going to accept velvet entries you took a five percent deduct to make it fair which wasn't really fair because you know you probably don't even lose an inch after you strip the velvet. Um, and, and, you know, accepting velvet entries was great, but then the records committee did not want to accept a world record in velvet. And uh, I, I was always uh, opposed to that mindset thinking it's, you know, it's not a second class trophy. It is an equal trophy to everything else. And, and the reasoning was, you know, it has that soft tissue on it. It's harder to measure. It's harder to be exact. Um, but once again, if we're going to accept it as an entry, <clears throat> is it the same as everything else, or is it just a, a side note? So I was really happy to see that the club, you know, finally come around and, and is accepting world records and, and ranking the velvet entries, just like any other entries. It's, it's a legitimate entry. So, so what happened, it it. what happened if it was, what happened if it was a bigger than the world record with the 5% deduction? They wouldn't well, have... no world records in velvet. The, the, at the time, the velvet entries weren't ranked. They, they had oh, okay. no records, which, gotcha. you know, everybody can look at the book and see what's the biggest and what's not. Yeah. But they, they didn't want to deal with world records in what they thought was an illegitimate category is the best I can come up right. with. And, uh, it, uh, and it's been a great asset for the club since we finally come around and, and accepted world records now we have a whole lot of categories where the potential for a world record is is much more attainable than, yes. than some of the other categories that you know we have a whole lot more entries and uh you know even a lot of the uh the bucks that were killed particularly mule deer some of the biggest bucks out there that were ever killed were velvet and they were stripped um so they would mm -hmm. qualify for world record or top 10 category. And, uh, you know, looking back, they, you know, it would have been nice if the hunter could have had the choice to keep the velvet on there and still yeah. 
be a world record. You know, I had a guy come up to me at, uh, I believe, the Western Hunt Expo this year. And he came up and he says, hey, I just saw some posting that Alan Bullen did on, because he had a, 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 it was the, it just got passed by Chuck Adams, but it was the world record velvet Sitka blacktail. And he said, I just saw where he stripped that buck can he enter that in both categories? And I'm like, no, you have to pick one. Yeah. Well, and it turns out to where he entered it in Pope and young as a velvet buck, which was the new world record. And then he kept that buck in velvet to display at our convention. And then after that, he had it stripped so he could get a hard horn measurement because that's what Boone and Crockett recognizes. So he's got, that buck he left in velvet for us and then he had to to take the velvet off to to get it into boone and crockett so yeah that's correct boone and crockett never has accepted velvet entries and and it's a little different for them because their seasons are typically late enough that they hardly ever get to hunt anything in the velvet yeah there, there are a few high country mule deer hunts where it's possible but that's that's about it um so that's that's we we try to um mirror what boone and crockett does and they try to mirror what we do as much as possible to yeah. keep out the confusion and and there's almost everything we do we're we're on board and we do exactly the same thing and there's only two exceptions really and and one of them is uh the velvet entries they don't accept them at all and and which is fine because we don't really cross over on those seasons right um, the other one is the way we measure pronghorn antelope and uh, there's a slight difference there and we've done it our way for so long they've done it their way for so long you really can't go back and change and and uh, the reason we do it different is because our minimums are smaller and uh, the, the configuration of the horns uh, are slightly different and and we the way we take one of the circumference measurements is different to accommodate for those smaller horns whereas the the Boone and Crockett minimums are so high on pronghorn. The, the issue we have is never an issue with them or hardly ever an issue. It gotcha. occasionally is, but. Yeah, it was nice. I, I hear people talk about that a lot and, you know, gosh, do you do stuff with Boone and Crockett? And we do, you know, our, our records chairs communicate, communicate frequently. Um, you know, we just last year did the joint measuring manual with, you know, Pope and Young and Boone and Crockett together in one, one combined manual that I think the feedback I've heard is that people are pretty excited about that. Cause I know a lot of you guys are carrying literally two books. When you go to measure, you, you were carrying a Pope and Young book and a Boone and Crockett book when you were out going out and about. And I think uh, a lot of guys are excited to have that combined now. Oh, it really is. It's a great asset for the measures because like you said, a lot of the measures measure for both. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, we have come together on so many things. We can have that, that joint measuring man manual that covers both. And, and it explains the slight differences, um, that I just talked about. And, uh, I was really excited to see that happen. Um, you know, my first term in office as president, uh, we were able to get, uh, our records chairman, a spot on their records committee and then their records chairman has a spot on our records committee so any records committee you know communication uh in the separate organizations uh, you know or the records chairman from the other organization is part of it and and it really helps that we can hear their take on it and then they hear our yeah. take and and uh, it's been so good for the two organizations to just bring the records programs together like that yeah i know we're doing uh, we have some joint measuring workshops coming up as well, which, which we're excited about, especially the one in, in May in Utah. A lot of people are uh, all of a sudden we're, we're finally having the first workshop in gosh, almost three years. And people are just coming out of the woodwork. We've got 24 spots and, and we're getting emails. It seems like almost every day folks want to be a measure. And, you know, we've, we've got other people who've been waiting for that three years to get into class. So, <laughs> kind of walking that fine line there well, yeah jason, what a good problem to have though people, yeah. people lining up to get in there jason you want to tell them about that uh that raffle that we're doing right now to announce in may oh absolutely we've got uh um 
it, winner choice, two winners. First choice gets either a moose hunt up in Alberta, Canada for a Canada moose. Uh, second, or, so that's one option. The other option is a Baku storm bike package. I think it's like seven or $8,000 worth of Baku stuff. Um, and so winner gets their choice. Second person gets, gets whatever's left. So we're going to have two happy people. We're going to draw that in May at the, the uh, Pope and young bow hunters bash. So, and I'll put the link to purchase tickets in the description down below. So if you want to go purchase It'll your tickets, great. scroll down, find the description and uh, the link to buy tickets will be in there. Yeah. And yeah, we that- are, we're giving away both prizes. So yeah, that, that's excellent. And, and when, when are we drawing that one? How long does that last? May 14th. Okay. Yeah. Those are great prizes. You know, everybody wants to go moose hunting and, and yeah. uh, the, the electronic bikes are, are getting so popular. Um, even if you don't really need it, it's just so much quicker and quieter. You know, they, they're better than ATV because all the noise. And uh, yeah. um, I, I don't have one yet, but I'm shopping. So uh, by this fall, I'm going to have an electronic bike. Yeah. And there's that, that technology catching up with me, but boy, you know, Jim, have a purpose. I had somebody ask me one time, they're like, you live in Kansas. Why do you need a bike? You walk 600 yards to your tree stand and I'm like, you're right. But I have found that there's two different tree stands that are perfect examples that you really don't have great access to unless you're on a bike. Um, because either you have to go through or, or across a bedding area or, you know, across where, whatever, but with a bike, you can take a long way around and get there. Um, and so I find them super useful, even for, even for whitetail hunters. Yeah, and that's an epiphany I had this last fall. Um, just like you said, you, you walk into your stand, which walking in isn't the issue, but the issue is how many deer are going to wind you, see you, right. all of that. And, and if you could get in quicker and silent, um, you're not spooking the deer. And that's, that's, I want one for hunting in Kansas. I don't necessarily right. need it for the mountains because um, there's not a lot of places, you know, the wilderness area, you can't use them yet as far as I know. So, uh, they're great in the mountains, but I, I want one for Kansas to get into the stand quicker and quieter. And, uh, just, you know, if you're, if you're passing by at 20 miles an hour and they, they catch a cat, a, a whiff of your scent, you know, are they going to get enough scent to spook or is it, right. be, well, what was that? And oh, it's gone. So, uh, um, that, that's my plan. So yeah. I think it'd be great for that. It's, I, I know I used them quite a bit this year and i'm not a bicycle enthusiast by any means but i i got one of the baku bikes and wow i used it in a lot of places when i was up scouting for elk um pre-season it was nice because you could cover a lot of a lot more ground on those than you can just hiking and then uh on my my idaho antelope hunt I was quite a ways from, from my camp to where my blinds were set. And so without that bike, I'd drive in part way in the truck and then walk the last, you know, bit. And the roads were so bad. I mean, they weren't roads. Some of these were just flat out goat trails and in a truck, you have to go so slow that it takes you a long time. And on that bike, you could, it was four times faster to zoom in on that bike. Plus you could drive literally, right right behind the blind lay your bike in the brush and and jump in it was quiet it was scent free and or or almost scent free and it was really proved to be a useful tool yeah they sure are and and here's a funny story um a number of years ago i I drew a bear tag in in new mexico my favorite place to hunt where i've only hunted once because i can't get a tag and uh it, it's foot horseback or bicycle and, and i borrowed a mountain bike from a guy and went in there and I ended up killing a, a really nice bear uh my second biggest one i think about six miles off the road with a bicycle and and uh i was, I was turning 40 at that time and my wife's bugging me about what what's going to happen with your midlife crisis you know some guys go out and buy a corvette and some guys go out and start chasing women again and you have all these different stories and I was like, yeah, I, I, I think I'm going to spend some money. I'm, I'm going to buy a bicycle. <laughs> and so that was my, my joke of a midlife crisis. I bought a mountain bike and, uh, 
getting ready to reach another milestone here. And my, my wife asked me, well, now what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to get an electronic bicycle. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my, that's my extravagant spending as I'm getting older. That's, so that, that was the midlife crisis of bicycle. I'd yeah. say, yeah, I'd say she got off easy on that one. Yeah, pretty pathetic, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, hey, they're a lot easier to store than a Corvette. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. Or, or another boat. So, yeah, um, yeah, there's that. Yeah. yeah. I, every time I see a boat for sale, I say, oh, there's a boat. And she said, just keep driving. So. <laughs> Yeah. Let's see. I, now I'd be driving along and it's, Oh, there's a boat for sale. And they'd tell me, they'd be like, yeah, that means it's okay to sell boats. Maybe you should start. Yeah, there is that. So yeah. I, I tend to like to collect them more than I like to sell them. Yeah. It's kind of like recurve bows, you know, <laughs> I, you can sell those. I thought you could only buy them. I didn't realize you could actually sell them. Yeah. That's uh, so I, I got a little bit of take from Dylan at the show after we had our, um, I guess it was a draw at the, at the trad shoot. Um, so w if you're looking at, at telling somebody, what's your advice on a starter bow? Where, where should somebody be looking for that? Or what kind well, of bow? You, you need to start light. And, and you can go cheap for a starter bow, but you need to start light. And, and I'm saying lighter than hunting weight, uh, just to learn the feel of it and, and to learn how to come to full draw and how to anchor and be able to hold it for a second if you need to. And, and that's, you know, I'm no instructor, but that's what every instructor will tell you is, is start, you know, some of the instructors will start you out with a 15 pound bow, 15 hmm. or 20 and, and, you know, not over about 35 pounds. Um, because you need to you need to get the feel of the bow before you actually get to where you're you're taking it out and hunting and and uh i don't know how to really do explain it but you have to get the form right you have to uh you, you know your bow hand you have to hold your hand right and you have to anchor it at the exact same spot every time and just get the feel for what it feels like to make a good shot and it's so much easier with a lightweight bow and and quality doesn't matter either you just you just need to shoot and shoot and shoot and then when you really feel comfortable with it then you work your way up to a little heavier bow and and uh you know it might take you a couple of years before you even get up to what's going to be your hunting weight bow which is kind of tough to take but um it's it's something that's kind of hard to learn so it's way easier with lighter weight and then so if you're if you're changing weights like that, would you recommend a bow that you can, you can change the limbs out on, or would you just get a bow that's say, you know, 25 or 30 pounds. And then when you're ready, go, go get another one. That's, that's a little bit bigger. Well, you could go either way because there are some great, um, three piece recurves and even a few three piece, uh, uh long bows. Some of the takedown longbows take down at the handle, so you can't change out the limbs. It just it's two piece, and it is what it is. Um, but if you could start out with a, a, a three piece, you know, takedown recurve, then sure you can get you can get any number of limbs later on. Um, and and if if you do that and you're happy with it, that's fine. But uh, like I said, you can start out with a lightweight, cheap bow, and uh, you know you pay a hundred bucks for it and you outgrow that you just sell it for 75 bucks and what are you out you know, you're really out nothing or you can keep it for a, a bow fishing rig or, or who knows um or just give it to somebody so uh so you can go either way and and i i did it totally different i was shooting a, a heavyweight compound bow and and i just started shooting a my first bow was a borrowed bear grizzly at 68 pounds and and i was the weight wasn't an issue uh but looking back i know i could have gotten proficient a lot quicker if I'd have been 45 pounds instead of 68 pounds. Um, but there were no instructors in those days. The, the guy that loaned me the bow was really the only guy I knew that shot a recurve that was close by that I could talk to. And he's like, yeah, this works. Just use it. Of course, he yeah. was, you know, he's, you know, next generation older, 25 years older than me. And he was shooting a 45 pound bow. And I should have thought, why is he doing that? yeah 
but uh, you, you learn, you live and learn. Very nice. And so of all of your, your trad trophies, what's your most prized trophy? Well, that big white tail that I shot in 2018, yeah. um, you know, you just, you don't even see deer like that. Um, let alone be able to hunt one and then be able to hold it together long enough to kill one, which is yeah. not, not easy to do. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, that there's that one. Uh, and before that, it was probably my, my second biggest white tail, you know, you spend, spend so much time trying to get one of those big bucks or I do. Um, it's just, it's just such an obsession. And, and, uh, most years you fail, you just can't outsmart them, but when you finally do and it comes together then uh it's pretty special and uh you know I, I have a really good elk that i killed which was you know to me another great accomplishment but it's you know it's one of those deals i didn't even know the elk was there until you know i drew back and shot him um mm. i was just looking for a big elk and finally found one and i shot him uh, so so yeah that the, usually the white tails yeah. You know, about the only place you're going to see consistently see bucks of that caliber are at the Pope and Young convention. Oh, exactly. Right. Yeah. 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 It was nice. I, I took a picture from the end on that left-hand side, from the end of that trophy display all the way down with just those, that, that massive wall of white tails. And it was, it was truly something to behold. Oh, and, and, you know, the other thing is we're, doing as well now as we've ever done as far as killing big bucks and and really almost every species with the exception of the you know maybe caribou um but we're killing bigger and better animals year after year after year and it's such a testament to the to the north american model of wildlife conservation and and you know you, occasionally you'll hear some anti-hunter saying that trophy hunters you know ruins the the gene pool and declines the herd and, and our records right. indicate that it, it's exactly opposite of that or, or, you know, by trophy hunting and, and holding out for the older and, and more mature animals that it increases the, the quality of the herd, um, which is another reason to have the record book to prove that they are exactly wrong. Yeah. Well, but to, to prove to anti hunters that they're wrong, we'd have to use facts and data both of which we have, neither of which uh, qualify as grounds to change opinions on that side. Yeah, you know, one yeah. side is facts and data, and the other side is pure emotion. Yeah, feelings. So it's, it's, it's feelings. It's it's hard to deal with emotions and feelings. Yeah, um, you can't change somebody's mind. But no, but the good thing is the the majority of Americans, you know, typically an eighty percent majority uh, approve of hunting as long as it's fair chase and the meat is used, utilized and uh you know it's what we do even if even if we're trophy hunters we still fair chase and use the use the meat and you know as long as we have 80 percent approval we're in pretty good shape yeah i was surprised um because i would bet that among other groups of hunters it, it would be less so but i i saw a presentation at the north american wildlife meetings I was three years, four years ago, something like that. And they had done a huge uh, study on hunting in relation to, you know, the feelings that, that non hunters had towards hunting. And I was surprised that the most accepted form of hunting in non hunters eyes is archery. I was like, that one just blew my mind because even in the hunting community, you know, you have rifle hunters who are like, ah, you know, bow hunters, this or bow hunters that. And, and so that one really surprised me when, when I saw the actual data that how well it's received from the non-hunting public. Yeah. And I think that gets back to is, you know, what's more fair to the animals than, than the hardest thing to kill something with. And, you know, you could talk about spears and slingshots and things like that, but, but realistically the modern hunting equipment there, there's nothing tougher than bow hunting. And, and like I said, that's the, that amplifies the importance of fair chase and, and it, there's nothing more fair than bow hunting. Yeah. Well, and that's, and apparently the non-hunting public agrees with that. 
Yes, so they do. It was just nice to see. I had never, you know, even being in the outdoor industry for a long, long time, I had just never seen those statistics presented that way before. And it was, yeah, it's pretty eye opening for me. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So, well, well, Jim, you know, the question that we always ask, because we've asked it before. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> You oh, know, I didn't, I didn't study for this test, Jason. Yeah, I know. Last time I love your, your, you're like, Hey, Jim, we asked one question. You're like, I know. Cause I listened to the podcast. <laughs> I was like, best answer ever. Yeah. So, um, you know, Dylan, what do we do for this one? We have a repeat guest. I think it just has to be something else. There's gotta be something else you carry, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, I think I told you one of the, the most important things to me is, is I carry an iPod with books on it, books, yeah. you know, audio books, um, just because it's such a great way to kill the time. And, and interesting enough, I never listen to a book when I'm in a tree stand because when I'm hunting out of a tree stand, hearing is so important because I don't want to be moving around. But, but if I'm in a ground blind, I listen to them all the time. Hmm. Um, because once again, out of a ground blind, your, your eyesight is everything. And, and you need to be looking and you can, you can look around and, you know, move your head back and forth and still listen to a book. Um, so there's that. And, you know, it, I, I listened to all the answers and, you know, the Uncrustables, that was pretty cool. Someday I'm going to try those. Um, maybe, maybe if you get them to be a sponsor and we get a discount, I'll buy some. Yeah. But I, uh, we're, we're I aiming think... after Diet Mountain Dew and Uncrustables, Jim. That's our two big really going after hard. I yeah, think I understand that. Maybe we need to have a special, like some kind of a special reception in Reno uh, convention next year with just diet do. And you can go to your five course meal here, or you can yes. go to the Uncrustable and Dusky meal over here. It was kind of like yeah. this year, you know, we had Michael Waddell with, with the pizza and beer. And next, next year we'll, it'll be Nick Munt with Uncrustables and Dews. <laughs> there you go. I'm talking about you, you heard it here first yeah so so okay I got one I got one um I I always carry this is one thing I always carry I carry a quarter inch tape measure with me and and you're gonna say oh so you can see the score right well <laughs> no that's not why I carry it I don't care about that at that time but uh as a taxidermist you need those measurements off of the the head and the neck on a on a for a shoulder mount and I, I always carry the same little notebook in a Ziploc bag and a, and a quarter inch tape. And I get the, you know, the nose to eye measurement and the nose to the back of the skull and then the measurement around the, around the neck. And, you know, and unless it's a bear, then you get the nose to tail and the circumference around the body. So, and, and I keep that in that notebook. And then when I get home, I entered it in a file in my laptop. So, you know, if I get around to mounting it 10 years from now, I, I at least have the measurements and I can get it done. So. So there nice. you go. Something different. Nice. I don't think All anybody's right. ever said that. That is cool. Yeah. That's some confidence right there. He's like, yeah, yeah I know I'm going to get something. So I I'm take what tape I need measure. for taxidermists. <laughs> yeah. That's I'm, I'm still the, in the, uh, thrilled. I got something camp. Yeah. So yeah, now, Jim, uh, you said on a, so on a black bear, even if you're just doing like a, a shoulder mount or, you still, the taxidermist would still need nose to tail. Well, no, that's for a life size. Okay. And, and, but there, I also have, I've been looking for it. I have a program. Um, it's an Excel spreadsheet that some biologist from North Carolina did where you can enter the, the length from nose to tail and the circumference around the body and, and get a really accurate live weight of the bear. Really? Um, be, because cool. I, I'm, I'm hunting big bears and, and if I kill something, I'd say, well, that's a 500 pound bear. You know, if you told me you killed a 500 pound bear, I'm probably going to say now, probably not. But if you have those measurements and you can show that on a spreadsheet that, yeah, this, this says, you know, 495 at these measurements and I, that's 500 pound bear to me. So the only bear I've ever so shot, Jim, the only bear I've ever shot was 200 pounds. So <laughs> I ain't going to lie to you there. And, and, you know, that's not a small bear. That's pretty average. Yeah, but if if you're hunting bears in the fall on the food source and and you're hunting really big bears, um, you could you, you know I I shot one one year. He wasn't my biggest bear, but man, he looked like a bowling ball. 
and and he was so fat his skin was as tight as a pregnant woman's belly um that's how fat he was and uh, you know he's still a 19 inch bear but he was he was easily over 500 pounds because he was in the prime of his life wow that's uh w- can we say that on air dylan no okay all right i was, I was <laughs> You know, that's all right. We have editing capabilities. You know, we've had this, we've had this, and it's not been on purpose, Jason, but we've got on the topics of bears like the last four of the five episodes. I know. It makes me want to, it makes me think maybe I need to find subconsciously, subconsciously, you really want to go on a bear hunt. I do. And I just got my results back a week ago and I did not draw in Oregon. So I'm not, I'm not sure what that means. Might be too late for me this year. Yeah. And Jim. I didn't draw in New Mexico and I didn't draw in Alaska and, uh, I messed up and missed the deadline in, in Utah because their stinking bear deadline is different than everything else. Um, I looked at it the day of the deadline and thought, well, I need to do that tomorrow. And then I got online the next day and it was too late. So, yeah. So Jim, what is the best? Somebody just wants to go on a bear hunt. What's the best? chance of success to go not chance of success of harvesting one but to go on the on the hunt um where where should they look to go well you know the the spring baited hunts in canada um all across canada are are the highest success you're going to get a chances are really high that you get a chance at a bear and and you don't have to draw a tag you basically have to book the hunt and be able to travel and get there um, and, and I know a lot of guys that do that. I'd never done that before because I have opportunities in the lower 48 that are easier and cheaper. And, and that, you know, like, you know, me, I'm a tightwad. So, uh, but if you want to hunt a bear, you know, you, you hunted Maine, you know, had, you had a good hunt up there. You can do that. Yeah. Um, I don't know how that the cost compares to Canada, but probably pretty simple. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, the Western states, you pretty much have to do fall hunts and, and not a baited hunt. And, and it's a tough hunt because the bears are sometimes hard to find. You really have to find the food and then you find the bears. And sometimes there's almost no food. Sometimes there's a little bit of food, which is perfect. And then sometimes there's way too much food and the bears are just spread out and you really have to search to find them. But it's a, it's easy to get tag and you know, if you don't have anything else going on, you can just go do it and it's on public land and just go hunt it. So if you're, you're okay with a low success hunt and a chance of, you know, if it works out getting a bear, then, then that's a great opportunity. That's fairly inexpensive. You know, I have a buddy, um, and they've started bear hunting in Oklahoma and they've killed some absolute giants out of Oklahoma. Um, last year he killed a 400 pounder. I mean, just a tank. And, uh, consistently they're killing pretty big bears just right there in the Kaimichi mountains there in Oklahoma. So is that a drawing or is it over no, the counter? It's over wow. the, uh, yeah, you do. It's, I think you have to buy like the whole, it's not like you can buy like a three day license. I think you have to buy like your whole year of out of state. So it is like a, you know, $600 hunt, but, um, yeah, just buy your tag and go hunt them. That's pretty cool. That's, I might have to check into that. Yeah. They've killed, they've killed big bears. Yeah. I'm kind of excited. Um, we talked to Dylan and I talked to, uh, an outfitter up in British Columbia and up there, you're not allowed to bait bears, but they have a really good bear population. And so we have a, um, actually it's going to be our event in May. Um, we're going to have a spot and stock British Columbia bear hunt available that we're pretty excited about. Yeah. And then that's a good hunt up there that, uh, you know, some of those coastal black bears and then on the salmon rivers, boy, they get some big bears up there and that, that would be a good hunt. I would, I would love to do that too. Yeah. And it's, I know some people are, um, you know, some people I think don't like the, the bait aspect of things. And so this is a good opportunity for them to have a real high, high percentage opportunity at, at getting a crack at a, at a nice bear. So, yeah. So speaking of baiting, I was at the Pope and Young convention this in Reno this last year and uh, a non-hunter wife uh, I was setting with, I think we probably sold a baited hunt or something. And, and she asked, how is that, how is that fair? How, how do you do that and enjoy it? 
And, and uh, I thought about it a little bit and, and I thought, well, you have to wonder about what's the purpose of the hunt or is the, does the game and fish allow you to hunt because they want to control the population? Um, are there too many animals? And uh, even when it comes to baiting deer, are there places where there are too many animals and they, they need you to kill as many as possible? And, and yeah, the baiting is probably easier. Um, well, it's obviously easier whether you're hunting bears or deer. And I, I don't like baiting deer because I don't think you have to, but there's places where if you don't bait the bears, you simply don't kill them. And, and there's already too many all over the, the, the United States and Canada. There are more black bears than, than they even know they have. And, and they affect the population of everything and, and not to mention human interactions and all of that. So, uh, you know, baiting bears to control the population is, is fine. You know, it's, it's an easier hunt because it's a tree stand hunt. You can usually drive pretty close to it. Um, but it's, you, you still have to, you know, wait for a big bear and you may not even have one big enough come in to shoot. So it's not like you're guaranteed a bear, but if for population control, it's really the only option in a lot of these places. Yeah. And I know like in Maine where we were, which I mean, you're in the, in the North Maine woods, you're, you're up against Canada and my phone kept dinging. Welcome to Canada. Um, <laughs> it was so thick, the thickest woods I've ever seen in my lifetime. And I, there, there was no way like looking at the lay of this land and how thick everything was, there's no chance of spotting and stalking because you can't see past 30 yards. Um, and so you, you literally had to hunt with bait. I remember a couple of the stands, like there was a, and when I say shooting lane, I mean, like you could get an arrow through it. That's about it to a barrel at 40 yards. And that was you couldn't see them to the left or to the right. You had to wait until they were in there at the barrel um, because there was just no chance of seeing them. I mean, just insanely thick, and and that's your only option. I mean, it, it really is. Yeah, and, and it's, it's fine that that's your only option, and it's a great opportunity to go bear hunting, and, and I'm, I'm all for it. I, I think it's great. Um, I don't do it very often because – for one, I'd have to pay to do it. And it's a whole lot easier to just drive out my back door and drive 60 miles and go <laughs> bear hunting on my own. But, um, yeah, it's, like I said, the reason you need to do it is because of population control. You have to control these populations and baiting is a fine way to do it. Yeah. Well, Jim, we appreciate you jumping on here with us today and having a discussion and, uh, as always, it's great, great to hear from, from somebody that's been there and done that. And, uh, I hope you can also appreciate, you know, the flip side of that on the Havelina end of things. So, <laughs> yeah, you're one up on me. <laughs> you guys are up on me. So this is, I'm going to celebrate that because it's maybe the only chance I get to be up on Jim Willems in the bow hunting community. So my well, first day. My first have, animal with a recurve was a javelina, Jim. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, that's, that's great. Um, but Jason, I haven't killed a uh, Colombian blacktail yet either. So there's that. That's on the list. That is now, on the list. You know what? Now it's a party. Okay. Before I was celebrating, now it's a full on party. There you go. So I've been, you know, Jim, I've been looking and, you know, back in the day, I had some good opportunities and, and, quite frankly, probably didn't capitalize on them. Cause when you're a kid, you just don't realize that, Oh, I'm not going to have this forever, but it's, right. I, I've been looking lately and it's, it's a little bit tougher to come up with than, than I even realized. So, but I, I am looking, I got my eye out. Well, that's good. So anyway, Jim, thanks again for, for jumping on here with us. Always a pleasure to talk to you. All right. Thanks guys. Yep. It's been a pleasure.